So welcome everybody. Uh, apologies uh, for that earlier uh, technical uh, snafu. Uh, looks like I'm on now. I can see people commenting, which is usually the the ultimate litmus test. Uh, just wanted to was just talking about how um, last week, of course, uh, we saw some rather extraordinary rainfall and then some extraordinary winds. Uh, in different parts of the state, the wind more in northern and, and central California, the rain down in southern California, where uh, there was some historic rainfall and some significant flood-related impacts. Um, of course, we're in a break now. Uh, the conditions have been much drier over the past three or five days. In fact, almost the whole state has seen a nice three to five day window of dry and warmer conditions. Uh, that's helping out a lot, letting creeks recede, letting hillsides dry out a little bit, although they are still, in most cases, saturated in all coastal areas. Uh, the interesting piece here uh, is that the soils now are much wetter, and, and the, 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 uh, the soil column is uh, still saturated enough to be resulting in ongoing landslides, not as many uh, mudslides, which usually coincide with the heavy precipitation itself, but some slightly deeper seeded activity. Um, just in LA County, there were purportedly over 500 in individual mudslides and debris flows during the event last week. The California Geological Survey was reporting, and I think their threshold for reporting is a little bit higher, so they're not necessarily talking about these little landslips that you see that you could uh, on the side of the road that you could pick up with a few buckets or something, but they're talking about significant landslides and mudslides, and they're, they're also in the hundreds, even using that higher threshold for the events last week. Fortunately, none of them were catastrophic uh, or huge. Some of them were damaging. In fact, there were a number of homes that were significantly damaged or destroyed in Southern California from these events. Uh, none of them seemed to damage more than three or four uh, structures individually, but of course there were hundreds of them, so that sounds like there were at least a couple of dozen mudslide debris flow events that, that were damaging to structures. So cumulatively, that's a significant number of them, and it's no surprise given that some parts of the LA basin saw their wettest two-day period in recorded history. This wasn't true all the way across the city, and the gradient, the, the ratio of the heavy precipitation that fell in lower elevations relative to the mountains was a bit higher than has been the case historically sometimes. So the mountains got off a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say unscathed, but didn't see as disproportionately severe flood impacts as you might sometimes experience during an event like this, whereas LA City itself and the surrounding suburbs were genuinely hit uh, pretty hard. This was not an extreme or catastrophic flood event by any means. I know some headlines have portrayed it that way, even though it simply wasn't. Uh, I only see that as good news, because who wants a catastrophe? But I will also emphasize that uh, this wasn't the big one in terms of the flood risk in Southern California. The, the big floods we know can and will occur in that part of the world at the upper end of the distribution are a lot bigger than what we just experienced. On the other hand, it is still good news that things weren't worse during this historic rainfall event. So uh, it could have been a lot worse. It was historic in, in many ways in Southern California, um, and I think that's the right context for this. As far as I know, and this, there was some question of this last time, I don't know uh, anybody uh, that there are any confirmed reports of deaths associated with flooding or uh, any sort of land movement from this event. So there were... Uh, a double-digit number of storm deaths overall, unfortunately. It sounds like the, the confirmed death toll is up around 12 or 13. That's always a tricky thing because sometimes uh, we don't count everybody or it's a little ambiguous the degree to which the weather contributed, but th this is a pretty conservative count for the most part, so it is probably up around a dozen or so. Uh, and most of those deaths actually appear to have been from the wind, so from falling debris, mainly falling trees, and mainly in northern and central California, but a couple of people in southern California as well, along with a bunch of uh, weather-related car crashes, which is always, a, again, a little bit hard to attribute to the weather directly, but that's apparently how the deaths primarily occurred in Southern California. It's not to say that others didn't occur, but they haven't been reported as flood-related deaths at this point. So that's that, those are the numbers we have to work with. So this was a deadly windstorm, um, especially uh, in Central and Northern California.
uh, and of course caused all the disruption and the power outages that everyone was experiencing last week. I suspect that the folks, some of the folks online today probably couldn't join last week because they didn't have electricity or, or a stable internet connection. Um, that would make two of us, uh, but anyway, uh, this break is much needed. It's fortunate we're getting it. This is one of the reasons why the, we're not seeing continuously escalating flood impacts as we are getting this break. And, you know, that's the kind of scenario that we really look out for in California uh, is these unbroken series of storms. We don't get those three to seven day sort of breaks in between. And we are getting that in this case, which means that's comparatively good news. But it does look like that the weather is going to turn more active and, and pretty, uh, pretty adverse uh, sooner uh, again rather than later. And so a weak system will probably move into Northern California Wednesday into Thursday. No, no big deal, some rain, some mountain snow, probably no big winds, no big rains, no big problems overall, but it will keep things wet up north. It will be a day that, another day that doesn't let things dry out further in advance of the much bigger storms that are likely to start moving in starting this coming weekend. So the big storms probably, you got until the weekend, Saturday or Sunday in most parts of the state, but they might arrive uh, pretty much at the same time in Northern and, cent and Southern California. So this won't necessarily be an event this weekend that sweeps from north to south. It's going, going to be probably more or less an equal opportunity event. Maybe Northern California is slightly earlier, but it's going to affect most of the state simultaneously because it looks like we're going to get one of these big bowling ball type lows, these broad low pressure systems that don't have as extreme of winds because the low pressure is distributed over a wider distance, but nonetheless are can potential to bring a lot of rain and potentially some strong winds, although almost certainly not as strong as what we saw last week in terms of winds. So the big concern with the upcoming storm sequence is going to be the water. And right now it's not 100% clear whether Northern or Southern California will, will see more of the heavy precipitation from the sequence. It might be both, honestly, given the trajectory. Uh, but this does look like a pattern that's highly likely to produce very wet conditions across most of California, starting again around this weekend and continuing potentially for a, a, a week or more. So another really active storm cycle, and the difference is this one's coming fairly close on the heels of the previous very wet storm cycle, and so the elevated risk of flood-related uh, impacts uh, will come sooner than it did in the previous cycle. So that's the big concern. Right now, the potential for extremely heavy record-breaking precipitation in Southern California is looks lower than with the last cycle. So that's the good news. This one may be a little more focused on Central and Northern California, which would, again, in comparative terms, be relatively good news. Although up north, in many places, it is now wet enough that a, a big storm cycle is going to start to re result in larger flood-related impacts and the higher risk of uh, landslides because the soil column is starting to become saturated at a pretty deeper uh, level uh, compared to where it was a couple of weeks back. Uh, it would be nice if we could get some additional Sierra snowfall to bolster the still below average, although improved, snowpack up there. Uh, and uh, that that's uh, going to be something that we'll keep a close eye on too in the coming days and weeks. So I will uh, probably don't not don't plan on showing as much uh, visual uh, weather model data in this session as in previous ones, although I will uh, pop it up on the screen in just a moment to show a general overview of the pattern uh, that we're likely to see. Uh, and uh, in fact, why don't I do that now? This seems like a good time to do that. Uh, I'm going to try to leave a little bit uh, a little bit more uh, of a moment uh, for uh, some, some more open-ended comments and questions, uh, question and answer session toward the end. Uh, of, of the stream today. Sometimes I, I spend more time on that than others. Some of the sessions are entirely uh, Reddit ask me anything style. Now, this isn't one of those, but I, I do want to leave a longer period for uh, interactive Q&A on this one. So I'm going to try and wrap up the monologue portion in the next 10 minutes or so and leave room for that. So let me just pull up a few things that I think are worthy of uh, visualizing because there are a few things of course uh, that are interesting in the context of the upcoming pattern and I think folks have uh, enjoyed seeing uh, the maps on screen so let me just pull those up uh, not I need to change over from sharing the radar as I was last week because that was constantly so active nothing to show for that 
right now, uh, which is probably a good thing. Okay, uh, so the first thing I will show, uh, again, this is the uh, Levi Cohen's uh, Tropical Tidbits website. It's, um, it's a nice uh, data visualization. It's open to anyone. It is free, so feel free to check it out. Um, okay, here, let me just get over to the right panel. Uh, so this is just uh, one model's representation. I don't like folks to focus on the individual run-to-run -run variability of the, of the control run of these models because it's just frankly one of dozens of possible evolutions and even within each model, the GFS model being the American model, the ECMWF model being the European model, each of these is run four times a day. Uh, dozens of times each with slightly different initial conditions to account for the fact that we don't know exactly what those initial conditions actually are. There is uncertainty in the way the world is right now, which affects the accuracy and precision of forecasts moving forward in time. So one way to get around that, knowing that we it, it live in an imperfect world where we can't know the world perfectly, at least at the initial outset, we give the models a range of possible conditions. Uh, and sometimes it's as small as, well, the temperature out there in that random corner of the Pacific Ocean, it's plus or minus, you know, one or two degrees. It's close enough for most purposes, but it turns out uh, that when you're doing weather prediction and when the butterfly effect is relevant as it is on weather predictions, uh, more than a couple days in advance, that cascading uncertainty, uh, it's really helpful to build an ensemble based on that uncertainty. And so when we talk about ensemble modeling, that's what we mean. It's a bunch of different runs of the same underlying mathematical code, but given slightly different initial conditions. And sometimes it can produce quite different answers, although hopefully they all cluster around the most common solution. But as, you, as we know from the past, sometimes that's not always the case. Uh, although it most often is. So this is just one example of one model run uh, at one time. So this is the 18 Zulu run referring to a universal coordinated time uh, and the Greenwich reference, uh, the most recent run of the American model. And I'm just stepping it forward in time to show the sequence of what this particular model thinks will happen. Uh, this is that weak system uh, late Wednesday into Thursday. Again, no big deal. Maybe some a little bit of Sierra snow accumulation South of San Francisco, I wouldn't expect to see much rain at all. Uh, it dries out on Friday before a more significant sequence of storms starts to move in over the weekend. And the storm, this storm on Saturday does not look all that impressive, but it's the storm on starting on Sunday this coming weekend that looks much more significant. And you can see, uh, again, this is just one model representation. This particular run brings an especially heavy rainfall event yet again from the central coast into coastal Southern California. Uh, and a, pers a fairly persistent one at that. This is, it begins on Sunday and it's tapering off on Tuesday. So that would be another two or three day major rain event. And in this case, the American model then gives another big break before uh, more storms come in later. But what I wanna do for a, a more representative picture is to zoom out across the whole North Pacific and look at what the ensemble, and for this case, I'll, I'll use the European ensemble since it's the, the slight favorite these days. Uh, here's what the jet stream looks like uh, a couple days ago. This is back on Friday. There's a nice little transient ridge. You can see this along the west coast, and this is why we were dry over the weekend. This ridge, you know, this is a pronounced split flow pattern actually uh, along the west coast. The little vestige of the of the subpolar jet sort of careening off into northern Canada, where by the way, uh, British Columbia is having an absolutely terrible snow season there's real concern, even though it's not dry, they've gotten a lot of warm rain. The big concern is what happens later in the spring and summer when those rains taper off and there's almost no snowpack in some, in some parts of the BC and Alberta mountains right now. So that's gonna be a big story potentially this spring and summer from a wildfire and drought perspective up there. But anyway, we had this nice ridge over the weekend it kept California mostly dry. Uh, here we are now, this is the present. Not much of a jet stream at all along the west coast of the United States or Canada, but interestingly, there is a robust subtropical jet all the way down uh, in the subtropics, as you'd expect it to be. This jet core is south of the tip of Baja, California. That is quite far south. That's around, that's between about 15 and 20 degrees north latitude. That's very low uh, latitude for, uh, and it's a classic signature of an El Nino 
uh, a, jet str the, a strengthened and southeasterly shifted Pacific jet during an El Nino year. Uh, but watch what happens as we go forward through this week and we get, well, what, what else but a, yet another Pacific jet extension. So I'll go back, I'll rock this back and forth. If you go back in time, you see this is sort of out in the west. And as the week goes on, this is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this jet, this jet uh, extension, this jet, jet streak makes it all the way to California. And again, this is the ensemble average, so this is a pretty strong signal for six days out uh, with the jet, nose, jet streak nosing in to Southern California once again uh, and continuing onward. So you can see that this will be a very favorable position next weekend into early next week for storm, major storm activity in California. And because this will be an energetic jet, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit too early to say exactly how long the sequence will last or exactly uh, the sequencing of storms. But it looks like we'll get at least, a, at least another pair of quite wet systems. Uh, and right now, the models disagree a bit as to the latitude in California that's gonna, that'll be the wettest. That was the European model, and now uh, this is the American model. Again, it looks fairly similar in terms of the weekend and early week next week pat, uh, setup. Uh, and actually, as we go into later into February, too, we still continue to see this strong subtropical ex branch of, of the jet, uh, which we don't always have in this part of the world. Uh, the subtropical and the subpolar jets, by the way, they're kind of idealized textbook concepts. Uh, we don't always see distinct separation between them. Uh, sometimes there, there, there can be a split flow pattern where there's a clear subpolar and a clear subtropical jet. Usually the subpolar jet is stronger. But sometimes, and in certain regions, especially uh, in the northeastern Pacific during an El Nino year, we tend to get this sort of really low latitude jet stream that doesn't quite uh, fit all the technical definitions of a subtropical jet stream in textbook form, but for all intents and purposes, that's what it is. I mean, you know, look at this jet core. It's south of Hawaii. I mean, if that's not in the subtropics, then, then where is it? Um, but in any case, this is a fairly favorable pattern, again, favoring central and southern California for above average precipitation. Uh, and we see this, uh, this is the relative above or below uh, the precipitation, whether it falls relatively above or below average for the period. And again, mid-February is on average a pretty wet period for most of California. Uh, here suggesting that almost all of California will end up wetter than average for a good portion of the next couple of weeks before things potentially calm down again toward the end of February. The good news is, once again, this doesn't look like it's going to be an unceasing storm cycle for weeks on end, but another solid one potentially capable of producing some flood and wind related impacts when again once again here is what this looks like i got to go back in time a little bit to get the full version of it from the european ensemble but here's again what it looks like the european ensemble is even a little bit wetter uh, but again uh, quite wet throughout most of california uh, with that tapering off closer to average towards the end of the period so another good water accumulation in california and this will put places in central and southern california way above average, not just for the month, but probably for the season and even for the water year to date. Uh, so uh, Southern California from a water perspective will be sitting pretty. The interesting thing uh, about uh, the, potem the temperatures during this event is they're not going to be extremely warm, but they will probably end up warmer than average. So if you notice that relatively warm blob over parts of California near the coast, it's not you know, a, a astonishingly hot uh, heat wave type pattern, of course, it's going to be raining. But on average, that's near to above average temperatures, meaning that there's a pretty good chance that the snow levels, they won't be extremely high, but they also won't be particularly low. And so relatively warm rains are expected, especially in central and southern California. So this might, the snow levels might be just low enough to produce good accumulations up at seven, eight, nine plus thousand feet, but this might again be a pattern that struggles to really accumulate large totals down at five and six thousand feet, which is where we really need it right now. So the moisture is going to be there. There will probably be some periods with lower snow levels, but it does not look like a particularly cold uh, storm pattern, at least uh, at this current juncture, because this is sort of the FA zoom in uh, on the western U.S., Again, it, it's kind of a mix of below, above and below average temperatures, but again, this is being influenced by these really, you know, this big warm blob off the coast. That's not a ridge of high pressure. That's just coming from the fact that the ocean itself 
is much warmer than average, and that carries over, especially as you can see, into the Sacramento Valley and the west slopes of the Sierra Nevada. If we do check out uh, the, the ocean uh, temperature anomalies, in fact, uh, this is kind of a hard map to see this on, so maybe I should actually use something else. But they're still well above average along most of the west coast, although there's been some cooling recently in places uh, where that have seen uh, significant uh, that have seen significant storm activity recently. So those waves churned up uh, enough uh, enough of the cool water from beneath uh, that it's a bit uh, chillier in that upper ocean column than it was before the last sequence of storms and that bomb cyclone churned out the water a bit. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show is uh, what's on screen now. You may recall me showing the ensemble plumes for Los Angeles prior to, to the last event, and some of them were genuinely extreme in terms of rainfall. There were individual members, if you recall, that were suggesting that upwards of 15 inches of rain could potentially fall in the coastal regions in Southern California. Uh, and some of them in the real world ended up being closer to that than some of us might have imagined. There were some places that got 10 to 13 inches of rain pretty close to the coast. UCLA campus, uh, with that rain gauge in Westwood being one of them. But we didn't see 15 or 20 inches, though, along the coast, uh, fortunately. But, but that's consistent with the ensemble, which suggested that those were outlying solutions. They were not the most likely solutions. They would require the storm to stall even more than it did. They would require the storm to be even more intense than it was and for there to be even more instability than there turned out to be. Fortunately, the, the real world actually ended up coming pretty close to the multi-model average, which is what you want to see in a predictive system that's doing a good job on average. And so I think that the modeling, considering that this was a historic rainfall event uh, with pretty good uh, predictability uh, a number of days in advance, uh, they did a good job with the last event. Now the reason I say I'm reviewing all that is this is the same predictive plume for the upcoming storm system. And again, this is for a random weather model point near Los Angeles Airport. I chose just to be somewhat representative of the Southern California coastal uh, plain. And what we see here is, of course, it stays dry in LA until about February 18th, so we still have a few more dry days to go. But then things likely get quite wet again. And again, uh, on this plot, the mean across all 51 members is down here, suggesting that the coastal plain around LA stands a pretty good chance of seeing somewhere between three and four inches during the storm cycle. Now, in a normal year, that would be a very impressive storm cycle for coastal LA County. Uh, this year, that would end up being significantly smaller than the event we just saw, although, again, the impacts would be outsized because everything is already soaked. So I would expect to see an increase once again in some urban flooding and some renewed mudslides and maybe some additional debris flows. But if the median is close to, to the reality for this coming storm event, sequence in Southern California at least, I would not expect to see as widespread or as severe of impacts as the previous event. But let's look at the range of potential outcomes. So the average ends up between three or four inches over the course of a pretty intense but relatively short storm cycle. But if we look at the range of potential outcomes, well the driest member that I can see, unless I'm missing something, looks like it's about an inch. So in the driest member of the 51 member European Ensemble, most recent data available, there's one model member out of 51 that has only an inch of rain in LA over the next couple of weeks. That would be uh, fine, given that we got in plenty recently, but it would be on the dry end. On the extreme upper end, here's a member that suggests that LA could accumulate another eight inches. That would be a bigger problem and would result once again in widespread uh, potentially significant flooding. But notice this time around, there's really only two, about two out of 51 numbers. So maybe let's call it this one, which is 7.8 and this one, which is 8.3. The rest of these numbers are well below that number. So we're not seeing about a third of them up in the 10 to 15 inch range, which is what we had for the last storm. Remember, the last event ended up pretty close to the multi-model average. And right now I see no reason to diverge from that here. A solid three to four inch kind of coastal plain storm cycle in Southern California looks plausible. Uh, usually you double those values up in the mountains, which again is gonna be another significant storm with some uh, renewed rain and debris flow type impacts, but nothing, uh, nothing extreme or necessarily historic looking about this particular event right now.
With a strong Pacific jet and a favorable overall structure to the pattern, that could conceivably change. It's always possible that the, the ensemble is underdispersed and isn't adequately representing the upper end of plausible outcomes. But right now, this is not an extremely alarming picture for Southern California uh, in the storm cycle, even though there probably will be a renewed risk of flooding. And if I pull uh, a similar point, and I'm just going to try and do this uh, in Northern California, let's call it San Francisco, if I can find it. This list is weirdly uh, partially alphabetical, but not completely, which drives me nuts. Um, you know, I'll just, let's just choose Sacramento since we're going for some low, low, lower elevation points. This is what the numbers look like for Sacramento, and actually the plume looks somewhat similar to uh, Los Angeles, which is interesting. Again, this is sort of an indication that it's more of an equal opportunity north and south uh, California type storm cycle. Again, showing maybe three or four inches over the next couple of weeks, which again is wetter than average, but nothing earth shattering. If the median is true for both of these cases, th these storms will, although they will bring some, some flood risk, uh, they probably won't bring anything to crazy if the current median is correct. So all in all, you know, disruption rather than destruction is the more likely outcome for this upcoming storm cycle. And the only reason why we're really even talking about this as a potentially disruptive storm cycle is because of what has come before. It's been pretty wet, and so the bar, the hydro antecedent hydrologic bar, is lower than it would normally be. So things are already wet. It's not going to take as much rain to start causing some problems. So uh, I'll follow this over the next week. I'll probably have another blog post at some point later this week and, and maybe another live session. Uh, but for now, uh, that is, uh, that is I think, all I really wanted to share on the visual front. So you're going to see my face back on the screen, and I'm going to start looking at the questions that have come in. So uh, bear with me while I, while I take a look. Again, apologies for the... Um, the te technical snafu at the beginning. For those who joined later, uh, that is because I literally did not push the go live button uh, enough times. Or currently, there's a glitch where you have to push it three or four times, and I think I only pushed it twice. Um, yet another on the extremely long list of things that I need to figure out but have not had time to actually deal with. Um, it's like a multi-page volume at this point. All right. Um, let's see here. Question from Rachel. What are the wind and water patterns that precede the formation of an atmospheric river near Hawaii or farther south? How long does it take for an atmospheric river to cross the Pacific to the Americas? Well, generally speaking, atmospheric rivers are... Uh, an emergent feature of, of the atmospheric wind patterns. So you can imagine that atmospheric rivers these days are defined not just as static plumes of moisture. So you think not just a big cloud of water vapor, a blob of water vapor, but specifically uh, water vapor flux, meaning water vapor molecules moving from one, from one place to another. And you can either get a very strong atmospheric river from extremely strong winds, which causes high fluxes even if the amount of moisture is only somewhat moderate, or you can get a, a strong atmospheric river if there's an extremely high level of atmospheric moisture but only moderate winds. Now, of course, the most extreme events are when you get both very strong winds and very high moisture, but uh, recently we, we tend to have seen flavors of events that are either more wind-dominated or more moisture-dominated. and. Uh, we actually have a paper on this a couple years back. Uh, this was one uh, led by uh, Kat Gonzalez. But the, the, the gist of it is that essentially you need convergence. So you need, you need movement of mass in the atmosphere toward a central axis uh, at, at, at a relatively low level of the atmosphere because, frankly, once you get up too high in the atmosphere, there just isn't that much moisture. That's a function of the fact that the, the pressure decreases logarithmically as you go up. Once you're sufficiently high, the air density is so low that it's just hard to get a lot of moisture. So atmospheric rivers are mainly 
lower atmospheric phenomena. So they're not they're, they're not driven per se, at least in direct sense, by the jet stream. So once you're up at the elevation of the jet stream, the altitude, uh, the, the air density is quite relatively low uh, up by where jet aircraft fly. And that's why they fly there, because there's less air resistance at that height. But in the lower levels of the atmosphere is where almost all the moisture is. And so the key uh, to these atmospheric rivers is often a low-level jet, which has different dynamics than an upper-level jet. And it's, of course, almost always much weaker. You tend not to get a 200-mile-an-hour low-level jet, uh, fortunately. We tend to get low-level jets that are more in the uh, 50 to 80 mile an hour range. In fact, sometimes those low level jets are what bring the really strong wind gusts to the surface during damaging wind events, as occurred last week. There, you were seeing some of the downward vertical momentum transfer of those strong wind gusts from the low level jet during that storm event down to the surface. It doesn't mean the jet is making it all the way to the surface, but it means some of that turbulence some of that momentum becomes entrained in downdrafts in precipitation, and that's what's making it to the surface and causing uh, causing trees to fall and power outages and things like that. The point is, it's that low-level jet that is doing a lot of the kinetic work in that uh, flux metric. So we talk about integrated vapor transport, IVT, as the vertical integral of the vector product of moisture and wind. This is why it's actually a kind of a pain in the butt quantity to calculate from data sets because you need a bunch of different variables in three and four dimensions just to calculate this fundamental quantity that tells us how intense an atmospheric river is or is going to be. Now, it's the bane of existence of folks who have to download large data sets. But the point is the atmospheric river requires convergence and movement. So not just a static blob of moisture, but it needs to be that blob of moisture moving quickly in the air above your head in that column, pushed mainly by lower level winds in the atmosphere. And that tends to occur most often in the warm sector of winter storms or mid-latitude cyclones, although not always. And you can get weaker atmospheric rivers simply by other products of convergence out there over the open ocean, kind of disembodied atmospheric rivers not attached to bigger storms. And those are usually not the ones causing any problems. Those might be essentially lines of clouds and light rain or drizzle over the subtropics, but they aren't doing much. But when those get picked up by a storm system or when they align themselves with the coastal topography of, a, uh, of an orthogonal or 90 degree angle uh, to the prevailing wind mountain range like you get in California, that's when things start to get crazy. So that's generally though, the, the answer to how they form is convergence and by nature, they are defined by movement rather than static blobs of moisture. And in terms of how long it takes to cross the Pacific, uh, it's really a question of the translation speed of individual storms. It can take potentially about a week for a parent low pressure system to get all the way across the Pacific. And unusually slow patterns or circuitous ones, it can take more than a week. And if you've got a really strong Pacific jet, it might only take three or four days. Uh, so it's kind of a function of the jet stream even though atmospheric rivers themselves are not driven by the jet stream per se, but the storm systems they are often attached to certainly uh, are, so indirectly so. So a few, there's a few kind comments and questions about, uh, I know there's been a bunch of articles in various magazines and in the press about my own uh, almost embarrassing number of, of articles about my own job and funding situation. And I think it's, I think it's worth uh, the, the word getting out there because it, it is surprisingly difficult to support this kind of role. One thing I want to make clear to folks is that I'm not... Um, I don't think it's really, it, it's very difficult to, to, to go it alone as a scientist. In fact, I don't think that most scientists would want to because science is inherently a collaborative effort when you work across institutions and space and time. I mean, that's, that's how stuff really gets done. Um, it's rarely the case that one lone scientist is truly uh, doing the lion's share of, of a work in, in, in any given field. And so... I think that a lot of solutions that folks have suggested, ranging from uh, become a full-time social media influencer or start your own uh, essentially charitable foundation, 5013C type thing, uh, 
I can see where folks are coming from, but I don't think those are realistic options in my capacity as a public facing scientist. Ultimately, scientists do need institutional support and institutional connections. And I have, you know, any number, dozens of great colleagues who I work with on a regular basis. And, you know, for all of their faults, institutions in this context do afford access and visibility that is really difficult to accomplish otherwise. So what I'm really hoping to do then is to convince folks uh, within the the University of California system, uh, increasingly aggressive uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, beyond the department level, because departments individually are constrained ultimately by the top, top level funding that they actually have, which right now is not great in most places, uh, to, to sort of foster roles like these. And this is true, of course, I'm speaking from a very self-interested perspective for myself right now, but also there are so many folks who would be great at public-facing science roles within public universities who feel extremely frustrated that there are not opportunities to do this to a greater extent. And folks, I know I've been working, talking with folks at the University of California Extension and ANR and even there, I know there's interest, but administrative hurdles are immense, and it's not clear whether we're going to be able to make that work either. Uh, so ideally, uh, some entity within U- University of California or the state of California finds a way to be creative with, with, with funding and uh, in which administrative rules need not be perhaps as restrictive as they currently are in trying to find a solution. So I think that I, I'm not sure that this is a good a target for a crowdsourced uh, solution, even though I greatly appreciate the support, and it does help at the margins, it particularly helps in cases where there's no research uh, or public engagement funding available at all, even just for the incidental stuff, like like the, the numerous software subscriptions and the travel and the equipment and all that. Uh, but it, I don't think it's a, an ultimate solution to the underlying challenge. So I'm continuing uh, to to not take no for an answer and to assume that there are ways to solve this. This does not really strike me as an unsolvable problem. It's just one, I think that it's a case of the, the right message needing to get to the right people and hope, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, but I, I'm optimistic that that will happen. And I'm grateful for all the folks who've written all these profiles. Uh, if you want a particularly candid one, the, the Stanford Magazine one out this week is, uh, gives you some, some, some further insight into my increasingly topsy-turvy day-to-day life. Um, but, uh, Thanks again for for the support, and if you have any connections to the uh, UC office of the president or something like that, that 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 would be a, that would actually be a very helpful uh, um, word word to put in on my behalf. But anyway, um, thank you again for that. Uh, Bill asks, "What is a mudslide?" And I think in comparison to mud flow or earth flow or debris flow. So I'm not sure that mud flow or earth flow are formally defined, but there is a distinct difference between a mudslide and a debris flow and a landslide. So let's start with the largest scale uh, thing, which is a landslide. Landslides can sometimes be entire mountainsides. There have been reports of essentially entire mountain faces falling into the valley below. This happens in the Himalayas, uh, sometimes with catastrophic uh, outcomes. This has happened in the Canadian Rockies a couple times in the last decade where there were very large landslides. Landslides involve many kinds of materials, including uh, large volumes of rock uh, that can fracture, so either loose rock and boulders or even sometimes fracturing of, uh, of what is effectively bedrock in the mountains slewing off, you know, that's what geology does over time. So the landslides can be extremely large and can be up to and including the size of entire mountains if there's a catastrophic mountain collapse. Sometimes in Mount St. Helens, by the way, uh, one of some of the reasons why one of the reasons why that that event was so devastating was it was a lateral blast from the volcano and resulted in the mobilization of an extremely large landslide that was essentially a third to half of the entire mountain that blew out with that volcanic explosion and then. Uh, downstream of that, there were these catastrophic lahars, which is volcanic ash mixed with water and other debris, and those pyroclastic flows. Uh, but part of why that whole event was so explosive and then resulted in, was able to result in such large py- pyroclastic flows and lahars is because that eruption was a, essentially triggered a landslide uh, that, that, that wiped out half of the mountain. 
uh, on much smaller scales, landslides can just be, you know, relatively small things that you see on the side of a road and a road cut or something like that. But the scale of a landslide can, can be from very small, something that might happen in your backyard to something that could affect an entire mountain and involves, uh, deeper, uh, materials that can be very deep seated. So sometimes the base of a landslide can be hundreds of feet below the ground, uh, in a particularly large one. Uh, and they, uh, are often triggered more by, you, by, 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 by disturbances that result in loading. So if you, so landslides are more likely to occur when the soil has, and, and, and sometimes the rock layers beneath it have become, uh, saturated by large accumulated volumes of precipitation. Mudslides, on the other hand, are usually sh much shallower, so they don't they don't begin as deep. Mudslides, as the name implies, there's a lot of soil in it, a lot of uh, organic material, so not just mineral rock, but stuff on the surface, and so they tend to be mobilized more by actual heavy rain events. So during the downpour, uh, the surface soil just gets too heavy, or the slope angle's too high, or there's some disturbance or instability and the soil itself starts to slide in, in, in the form of mud. And of course it can contain rocks and other debris, but fundamentally a mudslide and it moves down slope uh, in that context. A debris flow uh, is characterized largely, and my USGS colleagues might cringe at my informal definition, but it's generally a more mobile or, or essentially higher liquid fraction version of a, of a of a mudslide. Essentially, there's a lot more water generally in a debris flow in terms of its ratio to other materials. And so it's highly mobile, meaning that it can move very fast. Essentially, it moves as fast as a water wave would, because it is, in the end, mostly made of water. Uh, and it's also something uh, that tends to contain finer material, so silt and things like that, as well as large debris because if it's large enough these can tend to pick up because it's almost imagine what kind of debris would be able to be picked up by a, a flash flood five or ten feet deep it's just a sudden wall of water that's sort of the way to think about these events except that they have a significant amount of sediment in them so they're sort of uh, very muddy flash floods whereas mudslides are uh, very wet soil but where soil is the primary thing that's in them in debris flows, it's, it's, it's water is at a much higher proportion, and they're particularly dangerous, debris flows, in, in, in any, uh, to be clear, because they can move very quickly, far faster than you can outrun them, and in some cases faster than you can outdrive them. They tend to have a lot of energy associated with them, uh, because often uh, they can pick up very heavy objects, like boulders the size of, of large vehicles, and move them miles downstream, because again, you know, a mudslide or a landslide, once it runs out of slope, uh, once there's no longer a steep slope, it's going to terminate. It's going to stop. It doesn't have an infinite amount of kinetic energy. But the debris flows are going to continue, much like a flash flood, sometimes even into creek and river channels downstream because it is essentially mostly water. And so it can travel farther. Uh, it can have w more widespread impacts because they don't just affect a localized area, but they can be they can move quite far from their origin source. And we saw that in Montecito in 2018, where a lot of these debris flows that began up on the slopes above Montecito and Santa Barbara in such catastrophic form ended up making it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And of course, there's a lot of people and stuff that were in harm's way, in that case, in between. So the main difference is the, the relative ratio of water and the depth uh, uh, of the of the, of the column of soil or, or subsoil material that is involved in the flow. Landslides are deep-seated, often involve mineral rock, or, 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 and, and then the, the mudslides are, are mainly shallower and triggered by short-term bursts of rain as are debris flows, and debris flows are the, most fa are the fastest moving and most mobile of all of them, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they can sometimes be the most dangerous, because they move the fastest and they move the farthest from the steep slopes. You do tend to get more flash floods and debris flows following uh, wildfire events because A, you've removed a lot of the vegetation from the surface, so there's a lot more soil directly exposed to heavy rainfall, and B, sometimes there's an actual layer of ash from the fire itself, which can contribute to the um, the dissolve or to, to the, um, the, the silt or ash-like content, the slurry uh, 
uh, the density, if you will. It's sort of like a, to briefly, you can kind of think of it as uh, fast flowing concrete in terms of the kinetic energy and the amount of uh, downslope speed it can acquire. So before I get myself into too much trouble with the geology, um, that's, those are the main differentiations. There's a few questions about the uh, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, and although it's not directly uh, today's topic, given that we're getting close to the end of the questions, maybe maybe I'll take a stab at it because it is in the news right now. Um, so let me just see what else there is. Oh, it's kept ahead a bit. So there's a few more questions than I thought. Uh, but let me let me just go down. I'll, I'll, if it doesn't come up again, I'll, I'll I'll touch on it at the end. How about that? Uh, there's a question about the the modeling techniques and the 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 perturbations used in ensemble uh, building the ensemble. Um, that is a good question. I don't have the the details in front of me right now. There are I think I th actually think that there are different ways that different modeling groups go about it. But generally speaking, the perturbations in those ensembles are initial condition uncertainty. So essentially, if you take a snapshot of the way the atmosphere is right now at this very second, what are the uncertainty bars? in that snapshot. They're not trivial, right? Because we don't have weather stations, you know, in every corner of the earth. What is the weather right now exactly on the top of Mount Everest at the most remote part of the Pacific Ocean? Uh, I mean, we have, we have guesses, right? We have satellites that can look down and give us an estimate, but even satellite retrievals of atmospheric variables are themselves models subject to uncertainty. You have to trace the path of whatever electromagnetic radiation has come from the satellite and gone to Earth or whatever radiation has been emitted from the Earth the satellite is observing and the path that it takes is not totally certain because you guessed it the path that it takes actually affects the value somewhat so we have pretty good algorithms to retrieve it uh, retrieve these values from satellites but again they're they're models they're not perfect they're a better, much better approximation than just random guessing but there's still uncertainties, and so we'll never know with 100% certainty what the initial state of the atmosphere is. The uncertainty plume, the perturbations in these ensemble members, is designed to emulate a realistic degree of uncertainty. Obviously, even that itself is a model, but again, it gets us to a better outcome than not doing it. So for now, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but that might be a good question for a longer session later. Uh, there's a question from Kit, and I've gotten it from a few other people, so I'll mention it. There's a recent LA Times story quoted, uh, quoting notable climatologists saying that although we are expecting to see an in intensification of precipitation, we haven't yet in California. There's a few ways to think about this. One is that you can't find what you aren't looking for. And really, I don't think that anybody has done this study using the last decade of data formally at this point. I mean, so... It's true, I think, that when the last round of studies were done, 5 to 15 years ago, that there, there may not have been a detectable signal yet. But I, I mean, informally looking at the data, there, there is now. Uh, and so the prob this is the problem with the fact that science moves slowly sometimes, but also science only asks the things that people have funding to ask. I, don't, I think if we actually re-ran the same studies using the data from the 2010s and the early 2020s, you know, let's let's wait until the 2024 season is done. If somebody wants to write this paper with me, let me know. I, I don't have time or funding to do it myself right now either, but I'm pretty sure that if we formally wrote it up, that the answer would now be different than it was. And in fact, there actually are some studies out there showing that climate change probably has made some of the events we've seen in recent years about 5 to 15 percent more intense. There's, there's research studies out there looking at the sequence of atmospheric rivers that precipitated the Oroville Dam crisis, the near catastrophe up there in 2017, suggesting that, as I've been saying, that those storms were probably somewhere between 5 to 15 percent wider than they would have been, which in that case, you know, is a pretty consequential number, because had they been 10 percent less wet, we wouldn't have had the crisis in the first place, but if they'd done 10% wetter still, as they would be with another half a degree to a degree of warming, uh, 
we might have actually gone from a crisis into an actual catastrophe. So to think of it that way, you know, that's not a small influence at all. So the de de by the way, detecting trends in extreme events is difficult because the time series are inherently noisy and we haven't been observing them very well. So I actually tend to think the signal is there. And the main reason why scientists continue to say this is frankly that nobody has crunched the numbers recently. I literally think that that is what it comes down to. It's all, and then the secondary effect is, is the reality that yes, it's noisy. And even though the signal should be there, you know, if you look at any individual rainfall gauge, so like if you just did this analysis for, you know, San Francisco airport or LA airport or something, you might well not see the signal. Uh, because it's noisy at any one place, you know? Think about this past event in LA. Some parts of the city saw their wettest two-day period on record. Other parts of the city weren't even in the top 10. So which gauge do you look at, you know? San Diego has seen record-breaking rainfall this year. Parts of LA have seen record-breaking rainfall this year. Ventura has seen record-breaking rainfall this year. San Francisco saw record-breaking rainfall last year. Other parts of California have seen blah, 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 blah. It could go on and on and on. It's not a coincidence, but the signal to noise ratio is sometimes low. And so sometimes statistical analyses are underpowered. Some people, I think, underestimate the degree to which it is important to be very thoughtful about how you pick uh, data for a statistical analysis in this context. And the other piece of it, too, is that we're not totally blind on this. If, if we had no preconceived notions about what should be happening in a warming climate, if we had no theoretical expectations, whether extreme precipitation in California should increase or decrease in a warming climate, then I would probably hold us to a higher bar. You know, if we really truly had no idea, I mean, just had to pretend that all we had to go on was the observed record of precipitation, then we probably would need to wait for pretty strong evidence that precipitation extremes were actually increasing in a warming climate, right? But the bar is different here because the reason, the main reason why extreme precipitation should be increasing and likely already is in California, it certainly is globally, by the way, there's no question about this globally, is that a warmer atmosphere holds exponentially more water vapor for a linear increment of warming. And something weird, something very weird would have to happen for that not to raise the ceiling on precipitation extremes by something close to 7% per degree centigrade or three or four percent per degree Fahrenheit of warming. So that is my null hypothesis. The, the thermodynamics are so fundamental that we've globally warmed about 1.3, 1.4 degrees. In California, you know, it's it's more like 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade locally. The, at, at this point, given how basic that fundamental reality of thermodynamics and extreme precipitation is, we'd have to somehow explain why extreme precipitation hasn't increased by at least 10, uh, excuse me, by at least 5 to 15 percent over that period of warming. And so I tend to think that the only reason why we say we don't see it yet is we haven't looked hard enough. And it should be there. And I would guess my informal, you know, more likely than not uh, assertion is that the signal is probably there if we wait till the end of the season to run the numbers again. Uh, because it might not have been there clearly, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, but I don't, to my knowledge, no one has done this work looking at the right kinds of events, specifically at extreme short duration of precipitation events. So the trends in the wettest days or the wettest uh, several day periods in California. And I suspect that in winter, uh, in, our, in our core winter season months, as we're, as we're, as we're in right now, that there, will, that there would be a signal there or, or would be shortly. So I think that's where that's coming from. Um, and it's a, it, it's a complicated thing to talk about uh, because sometimes we conflate absence of evidence with evidence of absence. There is, you know, there's every reason to believe that extreme precipitation will increase and should already have increased, including specifically in California, even if no one has specifically run the numbers up through 2024 to determine that through 2024. So I think we're kind of at the state where in California, a lot of the, a lot of the things we're relying on are studies that were done 5, 10, 15 years ago, and things have changed. It's warmer than it used to be. We're in a different era. And if we're going to continue to make those claims, I think we need to rerun those numbers continuously because you know, and it's frustrating that there aren't more resources to do that in California. I continue to be genuinely baffled that California, of all places, does not have very many resources available for folks uh, 
uh, working on these issues in, in this part of the world. But that's a, that's a slightly uh, tangential story for the day. Um, all right, let's see. Um, thanks again for the kind words. Yeah, you know, actually, and this final comment, uh, that I'll take, uh, go, I'll go a little bit long today because there's some interesting things, and I, I have the energy, the green tea is working today or something, uh, but, um, so there's a question from Marty about thoughts about risks, uh, thoughts about, thought about, thoughts about the role of seismic and earthquake risks in planning for impacts from the changing weather, uh, weather conditions. It's hard to get structural engineers to think about the synergistic effects. It's funny you should mention that because just last week, I think it was just last week, I was uh, I, I gave a talk at an earthquake conference and I've never done that before. And it was precisely because seismologists and solid earth geophysicists are starting to think about this more, about how climate change is not so much directly influencing the risk of earthquakes per se, although there are some interesting hypotheses there. But assuming for a moment that the weather and the climate have absolutely no influence on the actual likelihood or severity of earthquakes, there's still the question of what happens if, you know, earthquakes in places where there are risks continue to happen at about the same rate that they always did, but in the context of a warming climate. And I do think that there are some really strong reasons to think about the co-occurrence of risks. And one of the things, I'll give you a preview since we haven't published this, but essentially these, these are the two scenarios I laid out uh, in this talk. There's really two big uh, combined extreme weather earthquake scenarios that I would worry about in California, and they're actually quite seasonal. The, they probably would not uh, overlap in their in their risks. One is maybe the most obvious one, which is the risk of fire following earthquake. Uh, California, of course, already has a big enough wildfire problem when we don't have uh, a secondary major catastrophe going on at the same time. But the challenge with a big earthquake, particularly if you get one, say, in the San Francisco Bay Area or in the LA Metro during the peak of fire season, obviously you already have a background risk of wildfires, but then in the context of a major earthquake, now you've got a bunch of potential earthquake-related ignitions, so we don't need PG&E to cause any sparks in that scenario. There's plenty of sparks happening because people's water heaters fall over or you know, any number of things can happen during earthquakes that spark home fires or fires in the wild and urban interface. And then the very worst scenario, of course, would be an earthquake either during or immediately before an extreme offshore wind event in the autumn. Uh, you'd have all of these ignitions immediately up in the wild and urban interface and some probably even within the city uh, cities themselves that were affected by the quake. And then you'd have essentially wind-driven fires, both wind-driven urban fires, wind-driven wildfires, and wind-driven fires in these interfaces. And that honestly is probably the worst case sort of disaster scenario that I can think of for California. Uh, the only positive thing about it compared to some other things is it would likely affect one portion of California only. So it would be, you know, an LA Metro event, but not a San Francisco event or vice versa. And that would make it at least a little bit more manageable than for a truly statewide scenarios. Um, but the other kind of challenge uh, would be a wintertime scenario say, dur immediately during or following uh, the kind of rain and wind event we had just last week, where you would end up having really high risk of, well, really all of the types of mass movements uh, we were talking about earlier geologically, but particularly landslides and mudslides. Uh, you would really see uh, just an enormous number of landslides uh, and mudslides following a historic rainfall event, combining it with a significant earthquake much more so than you'd see just from the, the weather event itself. Uh, and during a really significant storm event, you would also start to wonder about um, dam safety issues, uh, the integrity is of levees if you got an earthquake. Um, you know, the, the Central Valley, by the way, is not at as high a seismic hazard as many of the coastal areas in California, but it's certainly not negligible. There is some risk of strong shaking near the Delta levees, near the levees in the San Joaquin Valley near the water conveyance infrastructure that moves water both from the, the, the Sierra Nevada to, to the Bay Area, so the Hetch Hetchy uh, sort of headwaters and that conduit westward to San Francisco, uh, 
or the the water uh, the pipeline that moves water from northern to to southern California, uh, which crosses some of these fault lines uh, directly. Uh, you know, these are pieces of infrastructure where you actually could get big water supply problems hundreds of miles away from where the damaging shaking actually was. So there's really the, the two big co-occurring uh, seismic and weather climate hazards in this part of the world are probably the fire hazard and then the water hazard. And one of them is most likely you'd get uh, probably in the late summer, early autumn, that's the fire hazard. The, the, the water hazards you'd probably get primarily, although not exclusively, in the winter, particularly during a wet winter. The quote-unquote best case scenarios, I guess, if you want to be uh, glass, uh, glass half full, would probably be a major earthquake in these places, maybe in the spring during a moderately wet year, or similarly uh, in the, the late fall, but just after the first wetting rain, again, during a not extremely hot year, would probably be the least uh, problematic uh, times for a big earthquake to occur. Uh, in in a major urban area in California. So it's not a fun thing to think about, but it is something that, you know, the, the folks at the USGS think about, I think about it, you know, we are talking about these sorts of things. And I think it is worth planning for, because again, the more we think about these things before they happen, the less terrible it will be if and when they do. And my hope is that we manage to at least space out our disasters in California, and let's let's hope that the next big earthquake does occur uh, gently as possible in the relatively damp spring or it, just after a first early autumn rain, because that would probably result in the, the least bad outcomes in those cases. All right, and then the last thing I wanted to close with, because I said I would get back to it, there's this uh, there's this big uh, hubbub over the AMOC, the AMOC being the acronym describing the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. It's the big Atlantic Ocean vertical current system, uh, as the overturning suggests. It is, in a, it is a current in a vertical sense as well as in a horizontal sense, and essentially connects the surface ocean uh, in the North Atlantic all the way with the bottom of the ocean in the South Atlantic. So this this is a this is a circulation. This isn't like an ocean current where you you know you pop a message in a bottle and expect it to get you know to the next island over a few days or a few weeks later. Uh, this overturning circulation, some of the water that gets subducted, uh, are it stays in this circulation for decades, if not longer, before resurfacing. So this is a relatively slow moving system. Although again, it's enormous. It covers pretty much the entire latitude of the earth and it descends from literally from the surface uh, in the North Atlantic to, to the bottom of the ocean or almost the bottom of the ocean. The concern is that this big system, which is by the way, one of the reasons why Europe has a much milder climate than similar latitudes in North America. Consider the latitude of London, for example, relative to where you are in Northern Canada and what the difference between the climate of London uh, and Northern Canada is. Uh, but the the reality is that the concern here is that this system is potentially hypothetically or maybe not so hypothetically anymore at risk of significant instability or even collapse in a warming climate. This is the scenario very dramatically and over the top portrayed in the movie The Day After Tomorrow. Essentially, the difference being that in The Day After Tomorrow, this happens somehow between like a Tuesday and a Friday whereas this would take years to decades to fully unfold. On the other hand, years to decades for this to unfold, given how extreme uh, an outcome it would be, is not a very long time at all. I mean, the, the fact that, some, that, that if, if this were to occur, you know, many of us alive today probably would see it through to its completion is kind of an astonishing thought. And the reason why is that it would plunge Europe into essentially a reason, regionalized ice age, uh, while leaving the rest of the world on its continued warming path, and it would result in hugely chaotic changes in global weather patterns. The southern, southern hemisphere would roast, the Pacific storm track would go kind of nuts, uh, and there would be this, these extreme shifts in weather patterns that are very different from what you would expect from a more incremental or linear warming path. The big problem is that this was a largely hypothetical risk, at least at present. We know this has happened in the deep paleoclimate history of the Earth, uh, 
but we know that it mainly did so during periods where there was vast quantities of continental ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. So when the ice sheets covered much of North America, we're talking like when the ice sheets were a mile thick down toward Chicago or something. So the boundary conditions were very different than what we have today. Uh, we do not have anywhere near that much fresh water locked up in ice over the northern hemisphere. The reason why that matters is this melting of that fresh water in, into the North Atlantic that is thought to trigger these events by changing the balance of salinity and density and thereby essentially causing the, 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 the ocean current system to fall apart. We don't have that much fresh water stored in ice that could potentially melt. I mean, there's a lot, don't get me wrong, up in Greenland, for example, uh, but it is not nearly as much as there was during the, la the periods of time when we know that this kind of event was happened previously. So the big science question has been, well, how much fresh water melt would it take? How much density and salinity changes to the surface would it take to trigger something like this? And there has been some new research that is a little bit concerning, suggesting that we are maybe closer to that than had widely been believed, or at least that it's not uh, it, it, we can rule out that this is a theoretical impossibility. So there was some hope, at least for a while, that maybe this isn't even possible in the present configuration of the Earth system. And it's just one thing we can at least check off of our list. But instead, what this most recent modeling suggested is, in fact, that it is absolutely plausible uh, what the current setup of the system, and that perhaps the current system is even more sensitive to perturbations that could cause it to theoretically co collapse than we previously thought. And I have, you know, in, in some private conversations with some of the oceanographers and ice sheet scientists involved in some of this work, they personally estimate that there is as much as a 10% chance that this current system collapses this century. And I actually asked them, I double checked that that 10% number was actually consistent with what they were saying, because that seems like an awfully large number to me, as somebody who focuses a lot on tail risks, 10%, it's not likely, but it's not that unlikely, you know, a 10% chance of showers is a slight chance of showers in the weather forecast, right? Some people bring an umbrella when there's a slight chance of showers. And of course, the consequences there, you know, are pretty small. If you're wrong, you don't bring in your umbrella, you, you, get, you get rained on a little bit. 10% chance of something like this is, that's not, I don't think that's a very small number in the context of what it would bring. The, the, the immense even, I, I think that would be, you know, in that conditional hypothetical, fair to say, catastrophic type of disruption to global climate. Um, the problem is we don't understand this very well. We don't really have any idea how close we are at this tipping point. We might still be really far from it, and that's why there's still a 90 to 95% chance that won't happen. But would you be willing to bet the farm on a 90 to 95% chance that something like this doesn't happen? Would you get on a plane if there were a 90 to 95% chance that it won't crash? I certainly wouldn't. So, you know, 95% chance that it won't rain? I'll be honest with you, I'm probably not bringing an umbrella as a meteorologist. I don't, I'm not that worried about getting wet if I'm in the 5 to 10% chance that I'm wrong. But am I really concerned about a 5 to 10% 5 to chance of a collapse of a, of a global ocean current system that would result in a completely different global climate, not only to the one we have now, but also a completely different climate than the one that we're starting to prepare for finally. Yeah, I'm, that's something that one of those low probability but extremely high consequence type of events. So uh, that's, you know, that's my philosophy on this now. I am neither an oceanographer nor, nor a, an ice sheet scientist, but I talk a lot with people who are, and I read their work, and their recent work is not particularly reassuring, even though it is certainly not a portent of imminent or unavoidable doom. Uh, both of these things can be true, where there are some dragons potentially lurking out there, even if there's a good chance that we won't have to ever encounter them. Um, does that mean we should completely ignore them? I don't think that that's a reasonable, you know, you know proposal that's a reasonable path to take. We think about what the government does, for example, in, you know, in, in geo global geopolitics, and the notion of war games is precisely that we need to be prepared for low possibility, but very high consequence outcomes. This was very much the government's posture uh, during the Cold War era, and I would hope that it is, at least to some extent, still today in a geopolitical context, even if it's a little bit quieter than it used to be,
but why don't we do this for these other kinds of global threats? This is not some threat from within humanity. This is some, well, to the extent that global warming is a function of human activities, it's something that we've done, but it also is not something that there's any one nation or group of people that's particularly responsible. It's just a thing that we're all going to have to deal with that happens, and it's really not going to be good for anybody if it does. So how do we sort of quantify how do we kind of quantify those sorts of uh, potential conditional threats? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky proposition. And uh, I think some scientists are coming to terms with what it means to be honest about people about this, which is to say not exaggerate these risks or these possibilities, to be honest about the fact that the odds are still low. I mean, there's still a 90% chance or more that this won't happen. I'm certainly going to hope that it doesn't. But I, but I don't think that we can continue to just assume that 10% chance of a really bad outcome with this and another 5 or 10% chance of a really bad outcome with that, that everything is just automatically going to be okay if we continue on our current path. Um, you know, again, it brings to mind the saying that the climate system is an angry beast and we're poking it with sticks. I believe that was Wally Broker some years ago. And it's only more true today than it was back then. But the system itself hasn't changed. Um, it's just that we've, we're, we're further along in the, in, the, in the process of poking it with ever larger sticks. Um, and so far, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't lashed out in a rapidly accelerated way, but it's not necessarily going to be always the case uh, So in all foreseeable futures. So... Now, on that relatively uh, scary note, uh, I did want to point out that uh, right now uh, in California, there's no there's no portent of imminent doom there either. There is an active storm cycle coming up, but it does not look extremely severe. Right now, it looks slightly less significant than the last one, actually, but it might be aimed more at Northern California versus Southern California, although it's still a little bit hard to tell. So I'll probably have another blog post, um, another... Uh, another live session later this week to discuss it more but right now i am I, I think there will likely be some flooding some additional mudslides some additional wind issues but right now if the multi-model ensemble averages are close to reality it shouldn't be anything that california can't handle so for, for now uh, i'll leave it at that and i'll join you all later on thanks for watching